Eric Gordon hits the game winner, giving the Houston Rockets the 118-116 win against the Orlando Magic, improving the win streak to five games in a row. Now, and with the Phoenix Suns loss at the hands of the Golden State Warriors, that means that your Houston Rockets now own the longest win streak in the NBA. We're going to break it all down for you right here at Locked on Rockets. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six. Five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another episode of Locked on Rockets, the best and only daily podcast covering your Houston Rockets. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and co-host of Locked on NBA Thursdays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. Rockets coming away with such a huge win against the Orlando Magic, 118-116, improving the win streak to five games in a row now. And I cannot wait to break down all the different stories and you know different different angles from this game. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Truebill. Truebill is the new app that saves you money by helping you identify and stop paying for the subscriptions that you don't want or need and can even negotiate better deals on the ones that you want to keep. Go check out Truebill. Now, I will say that, <clears throat> oh goodness, it's already starting. Oh, Lord have mercy. I have been battling this cough. I don't know what it is. Um, thankfully, it's definitely not COVID because I've taken a couple uh, or I've gotten a couple negative test results already, but um, it's definitely been a little rough around the edges. So I do apologize. I was complete, completely decommissioned Thursday evening. And then as much as I really wanted to do a podcast, Friday night after the Rockets picked up the win against the Orlando Magic that evening, I was still not feeling super hot. So here I am Saturday night. I'm feeling a little bit better. And so I'm going to try and power through this podcast. We'll see how, how much coughing winds up taking place. So I do apologize for that uh, ahead of time. But how could I not want to talk about this win? The, Rock, the Rockets extending the win streak to five games, now owners of the largest uh, longest win streak in the NBA now with the Phoenix Suns uh, finally being stopped by the Golden State Warriors. But thanks to Eric Gordon, he's the guy that, you know, brought this game home for the Houston Rockets, a huge bucket at the end of regulation to seal this game, a pair of back-to-back -back floaters really for Eric Gordon uh, sealing this game for the Houston Rockets. No Kevin Porter Jr. unfortunately played about 18 minutes in this game before, you know, just before halftime, looking a little, you know, moving really gingerly, had a play where he came up limping, hobbling a little bit, did not look 100% right. And then John Lucas basically explaining at halftime as they were headed back to the tunnel that they would check on KPJ and, you know, see if he was good to go for the second half. He was not, unfortunately, Armani Brooks starting the second half in place of Kevin Porter Jr. And we're going to talk about that whole situation with KPJ, his recurring, uh, you know, thigh issue, all of that a little bit later in the episode. But I want to stay focused on Eric Gordon right now, uh, who is absolutely the player of the game for the Houston Rockets, finished with 24 points, 10 of 14 shooting overall, four of six from behind the arc, uh, had two rebounds, three assists, one steal, one block, did have four turnovers. And unfortunately, right, at times the offense got a little sticky in this game for the Rockets because let's face it point EG isn't exactly the prettiest thing to see, but it got the job done in this game. And especially down the wire, you know, when you need a bucket, Steven Silas is able to trust, you know, Eric Gordon as a veteran that he's going to make the right read, make the right play and to put the ball in his hands at the end of this game. Steven Silas said post game that the, the, play that they had drawn up, it was basically either a look for Christian or a look for Eric. And, you know, Eric had the ball in his hands and he was the one who had to make had to make the decision as to where things were going to go. And just, you know, a couple plays prior, Eric had hit a floater uh, to, you know, the, the 
final bucket before the game winner that he hit. So a pair of really clutch fo- floaters down, uh, you know, down the stretch of this game for Eric Gordon uh, to bring the W home for the Houston Rockets. And even, even when the offense was a little clunky in this one, like the Rockets kind of started to fall apart a little bit, uh, you know, looking a little disjointed, especially without Kevin Porter Jr. out there at the start of the third quarter, who I will say KPJ looked just phenomenal in the brief stint that he got to play in this game. He had eight points, uh, the two of eight shooting, not super great. The one of six, three point shooting. You love the aggressiveness from KPJ, but you know, you'd like to see those shots actually start converting a little bit more frequently than they have been as of late. But it was the eight points and the six assists that really stood out from KPJ in the 18 minutes that he was able to play. So, And there were a couple highlight assists that I want to bring up a little bit later on. <clears throat> but with Eric Gordon, you know, there was a point in the third quarter where the Rockets kind of started to fall behind. They fell behind by about, it was about almost double-digit points, like 67-59 or, you know, 69-59, somewhere around there. And EG comes up and drills a timely three pointer. Then Christian Wood comes up and drills a three. Then EG gets another three, you know, a possession or two later. And the Rockets kind of claw their way back into it. So things started to kind of unravel a little bit in that third quarter. And I think a big part of that was not having Kevin Porter Jr. on the floor to facilitate, to orchestrate the offense, because he's been doing a phenomenal job of really steering things, being the point guard on the floor for this Houston Rockets team. But the Rockets made timely shots when they needed it. Christian Wood, who had a really quiet first half, just two points scored in the first half, scored the rest of his 20 points, so 18 points coming in the second half, had a really dominant third quarter. Jay Sean Tate had another really, really impressive game. Garrison Matthews, uh, another 16-point outing, uh, shot 3 of 10 from behind the three-point line, picked it up a bit in the second half, had a big you know, 10 points in the fourth quarter. And then Alperin Shingun, who continues to do things uh, and just impress on a nightly basis. I do want to talk about all those guys. Um, but with Eric Gordon, you know, the way that he's playing right now is – it's it's honestly superb, and there have got to be contenders and, and playoff teams that are absolutely dialing up the phone trying to get to Rafael Stone right now, you know, basically getting ready to pitch, you know, whatever offers they can for Eric Gordon. And I'm I'm resigned to the fact that EG's not gonna be Houston Rocket for much longer. It it sucks. Um, as he and you know Daniel House are kind of the you know final remnants of uh, the older Houston Rockets era teams, and even really not even Daniel House because he was you know there the following season, but uh, Eric Gordon being the final remaining member of the team that took the Warriors to seven games. So it's going to be a sad day when Eric Gordon gets traded, but hopefully it'll be to a contender where he has a chance to really fight for a chip and play some you know meaningful basketball again. Because even though the Rockets are winning now, and you know the mood has shifted and the energy around the team is significantly better, you know riding this five game winning streak. Eric Gordon's a veteran, right? He doesn't he doesn't want to be here for this rebuild. He wants to go play competitive basketball somewhere and be in, you know, high stakes playoff games like he's been for the last few years of his career. So I hope that the Rockets are going to be able to acquiesce and, you know, get him sent to a contender, but got to give credit to EG for bringing this W home. We're going to talk about all the other players from this game and what made this win possible as this win streak continues for your Houston Rockets. But first, a quick message from our friends over at Truebill because look, Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. Look, that happens to me all the time, right? On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap, one click. One button. It is that easy. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. We thank you for making Locked on Rockets your first listen of the day. So I am I'm working overtime here. It's not really overtime, but I'm, I'm trying to make up the the missed Friday episode. <coughs> there it goes. I'm so sorry. Trying to make up the missed Friday episode, and I uh, want to be able to talk about this. You know, Orlando Magic win. The the different players and standouts from this game. 
especially because, you know, I didn't want to have to cram talking about the Orlando Magic win and what will hopefully, knock on wood, be a win against the lowly New Orleans Pelicans Sunday evening. So with that, let's go first to Christian Wood. Um, because Christian Wood definitely had a subpar first half. And I think a big part of that was the, he was he just wasn't the same level of aggressive that we've seen him be, you know, throughout this win streak so far. Um, he spoke about it post game and talked about the fact that coaching staff, Steven Silas, you know, saying he just needs to be aggressive, right. To stay ready to, to can, you know, to continue to attack with conviction, And he wasn't doing that in the first half. And I think it may have also been a little bit of, you know, KPJ not doing, you know, his best to find Christian Wood on some of those roles. Um, Maybe, you know, kind of a combination of factors, right? Christian Wood not not rolling with enough intensity and purpose towards the rim, trying to get some things going inside. He had four shot attempts in the first quarter and none of them were at the rim. They were all like perimeter looks, I believe, if not, if I'm not mistaken, um, So, you know, playing very much an outside game until that third quarter where he did really kind of start to take over and we showed flashes of that dominant play that we've seen throughout most of this win streak. So Christian kind of approaching the game with a bit of a different mentality in that second half. And and even Christian came out and said he was, you know, Silas said he was frustrated in the first half. Uh, John Lucas commented the fact that certain guys weren't getting enough touches, so they weren't competing as hard on defense because John Lucas just keeps it real. Um, and so the Rockets did change that. They went back into the locker room at halftime. They fixed up their mentality. They came out in the second half, and Christian Wood was significantly m- much more aggressive, which changed the entire tone of the game. So shout out to Christian Wood for you know maintaining that mentality on the way to a 20-point, 14-rebound, four-assist, one-steal, one-block performance, uh, You know, definitely stepping up his play in the second half. And the other big that I want to talk about is Alperin Shingu. And I'm going to spend the rest of this segment talking about Al Prince Shingun because how absurd is this man? I'm going to get to the play of the game from Shingun here in just a second because I think it was absolutely the play of the game, uh, as well as the fact that we saw a, a brief stint of the double big lineup making its resurgence. Um, so the double big lineup is not dead and gone. It, it is it is back and with a bit of a vengeance. But Alperin Shingun continues to just impress so much on the basketball floor. And it was great to hear Steven Silas say post game, right? That part of the decision for why Shingun and Wood, you know, started sharing the floor is, is he, he, Silas said, I needed to get Christian back into the game, but Al P was playing so well, I didn't want to take him out. And so he was willing to run the double big lineup with Al P and Christian Wood. And I want to talk about that double big lineup a little bit and what that kind of means moving forward for this Rockets team. And if we're going to see that uh, more a little bit down the line, but Al P had so many standout plays from this game. So first off, he had the one where he completely shook, I believe it was Mo Bamba. Um, it was either Mo Bamba or Wendell Carter Jr., I think. It completely shook one of them. You know, kind of started to drive the ball in, spun at the free throw line, and hit like this Dirk Nowitzki-esque like fade. And the ball kind of hit back iron and then dropped in. But it was just such a polished, like just crisp, clean move. And it seems like at least once a game, Al P breaks something out. And I'm just like, this is a 19-year-old kid. And he shouldn't be able to be pulling off moves like this with this much success. you know. And yet he is. And every single game, he leaves me with my jaw on the floor at least once throughout the game. He had the uh, the and one play uh, with about like seven, eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Uh, as the Rockets started kind of a, a tear at the top of the fourth quarter, sparked by by Al P and some really impressive bench play, uh, which, side note, all of the bench players had a positive plus minus in this game for this Rockets team, and then all the starters had a negative plus minus. The bench absolutely carried this game for the Rockets, and Al P was a huge part of that. So he had the the, the and one play where he, you know, got the ball up, finished through contact, and then just hit him with the flex cam as he was walking away, which like, it was just, it was just amazing. Seeing Al P hit him with the flex, I was, I was blown away by that. But easily and hands down the play of the game from Al P on his way to 13 points on three of six shooting, one of three from behind the arc, six of seven at the free throw line. It was very aggressive getting the charity stripe in this game. Three rebounds, five assists, and a block. Alp had hands down one of the highest basketball IQ plays 
that I've seen from this Rockets team this season. And it just shows how Alp processes the game and how easy and natural it comes to him. So Garrison Matthews is walking the basketball up. And he's walking the basketball up court, and Al P's at the top of the key, and and Garrison starts to kind of like pass the ball to Al P, like he wants to, you know, he's like, and Al P said, you know, like waves him off, points to Christian Wood in the post, and like basically, says, you know, throw the ball into Wood. So Garrison Matthews throws the ball into Christian Wood, and then Al P, you know, Garrison starts to kind of drift back towards, you know, towards the the top of the key, and then Al P realizes where Garrison Matthews' man is and sets a flare screen to completely negate Matthews' man to open him up for a wide open three. And then Christian Wood just skip pass right to the top of the key for for Matthews and he just drains the three-pointer. That play, that sequence, even though it was only, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and it happened so quickly that you would have missed it if you weren't like actively paying attention to it. It stood out, and it just shows how Alperin Shingun processes the game, how he reads things, how he creates opportunities for his teammates. He generates so much offense, be it with the ball in his hands, be it as a screener, be it as a roller, whatever it is. He is so ridiculously talented offensively. It was great to see Steven Silas kind of run with him, and you know, especially in the absence of Kevin Porter Jr. in this second half of this game. You know, it, we kind of were, were hoping that we would see it in, in the game prior with, with no KPJ. You know, who, who were the Rockets going to lean on with no primary facilitator? And I felt like they probably could have leaned on Alper and Shingun a little bit more. They definitely did in this game. And he found a lot of success doing it. You know, he can he's somebody that you can absolutely run the offense through. And he's going to time and time again find, you know, a way to either create something for himself, draw a foul, create for a teammate, all of that. And Garrison Matthews even spoke about this shot post game because I asked Garrison, I was like, hey, so, you know, I walked him through the play specifically. And he said, you know, talking about Alper and Shingun, he said, he's such a super smart player. I wouldn't have gotten that shot if it wasn't for him and then Seawood making that pass. The way Alp set it up, it was just a really smart play by him. And Garrison Matthews made sure to explain post game that all of his shots come from his teammates. Like he's not out there creating his own looks. They're coming off of, you know, passes, you know, and, and created opportunities from his teammates. And he's very vocal about that. So he understands his role and he understands how to play it to a T. And again, for, for this team to now have guys like Garrison Matthews, Gary Bird, uh, if you will, and Armani Brooks as shooters who you can consistently plug into the lineup and have threats for guys like Alper and Shingun, Kevin Porter Jr., Jay Sean Tate, Christian Wood, whose playmaking has been really solid as of late, right? And, and he's, a, he's a capable playmaker when he's drawing in defenses and when he's, you know, operating out of the middle of the floor. Having threats like that on the perimeter is what opens up so much of this offense for Steven Silas. And I think a big point that, that absolutely should be hammered home is the Rockets have continually started to look like a very, very potent offensive team. And a good indicator of that is how well they're passing the ball off of like made shots. So the Rockets in this game against the Orlando Magic had 44 made shots. They had 33 assists on 44 made shots. You're finally seeing Steven Silas's vision for this team kind of come together offensively where there's a lot of driving kick. There's a lot of creating for others. The ball movement has been great. And we're finally kind of seeing all of that culminate and come together. And unfortunately, it, it, it sucks that it took this long to get to this point. But finally seeing it kind of pieced together now against a couple quality teams in the Chicago Bulls and the Charlotte Hornets, and then a couple back-to-back -back wins against OKC, and now another win against another bottom-dweller team in the Orlando Magic. It'll be interesting to see how they're able to keep this going moving forward as they start to face more difficult competition down the line. So there are some other players and some other points from this game that I want to tackle and bring up. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Built Bar. Because look, when it comes to protein bars, Built Bars are the only option. They are the number one protein bar on the market. They've got so many amazing flavors to choose from. Strawberry, German chocolate, mint chocolate, my personal favorite, coconut brownie chunk. You cannot go wrong with a single flavor on their menu. Every single bar is low-cal, low-sugar, high-protein, high-fiber, amazing 
if you're on a keto diet, great if you're trying to lose weight, great if you're just trying to stay where you're at, right? I grab a couple of built bars when I'm headed out the door in the morning sometimes, just as a little like, you know, breakfast replacement, what have you. They're great. You can check them out. Just visit built.com and use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your next order of the best tasting protein bars on the market. I've said it once, I'll say it again. They're protein bars that taste like a candy bar. So again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. We appreciate you making Locked On Rockets your first listen of the day. For your second listen, go check out Locked On Fantasy Basketball with host Josh Lloyd. If you care about fantasy hoops at all, you've got to go check out Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Now, I do want to flip things over to the other side of the aisle for a quick second. The Orlando Magic, Cole Anthony was one of the whole reasons that this you know that this game became even remotely close rockets were up you know had a double digit lead you know one point in the fourth quarter and the the magic went on a you know ridiculous tear sparked by Cole Anthony who had i think it was somewhere like 8 10 points somewhere in that run uh in the fourth quarter to get the magic you know well back within striking distance in this game and then not only that Terrence freaking Ross like it's every game Every game, some random bench player decides that they're going to, you know, go supernova against the Houston Rockets. And this time around, it was Terrence Ross who had a stretch where he was just refused to miss anything. He had 18 points off the bench for the Magic, you know, and and almost spoiled the Rockets, you know, winning streak with his just absurd play off the Magic bench. So I just wanted to point out a couple of those guys from the Magic side of things. But let's flip over to... Jay Sean Tate, who continues to be really impressive, uh, you know, over the stretch of games, he has been easily the most consistent rocket this season. He steps up, he's able to do so many different things on the floor. And I want to pivot from a point about Jay Sean Tate into a point that has to do with Shingun and the double big lineup. Um, but Jay Sean Tate in this game, 15 points, six of 16 shooting, uh, you know, the efficiency, not quite where it usually is for Jay Sean on his shooting numbers. Uh, two of six from behind the three point line, only went to the free throw line once, but picked up seven rebounds, had three offensive rebounds. Look, if I, if I need, if, if my life depended on it and I needed somebody to secure an offensive rebound, I would feel pretty damn good about my chances of like picking Jay Sean Tate to pick up that offensive board. Like that's just how aggressive he is and how hard he works to pick up these offensive. The dude is six, four and comes away with offensive rebounds that he has no business getting. And not only does he secure these offensive rebounds, he's not just getting the offensive rebounds and like kicking them back out for threes. He's getting these offensive rebounds and finishing in traffic over like seven footers at times. It's absolutely absurd what he's able to do inside the paint at just at a, at a staggering six foot four inches. Uh, but again, seven rebounds, four assists, two steals, one block, uh, one turnover for Jay Sean Tate. Uh, wasn't a bit of foul trouble this game. Finished with five fouls, you know, kind of felt like he was getting you know, at times maybe a bit of an unfavorable whistle, maybe being a little bit too overly aggressive on defense against the Magic. Um, but he did have, you know, the one the one critical turnover uh, at the end of regulation where the Rockets, uh, coming out of a timeout, had a five-second violation on an inbounds play. That was absolute pain. Like, as far as, like, late-game execution goes, that's one of those where you're just like, Ugh. and this comes off of... <clears throat> The game against the uh, Charlotte Hornets, where Jay Sean Tate tried to inbound, you know, the the ball to Christian Wood and had what turn, what resulted in a turnover uh, that you know could have cost the Rockets the game against the Charlotte Hornets. So I don't want to say this is an area of concern for Jay Sean Tate, but I will say that you know late game execution, the Rockets need to clean up uh, their their inbounding on late game, you know late game moments and whatnot. So they don't have, you know, issues like this down the line. But uh, I do want to bring up the Christian Wood, Alper and Shingun pairing uh, just before I dive into that topic point and talk about, you know, the pairing, the, the spacing issues that the Rockets have dealt with a lot this season and how that pairing doesn't really struggle with those issues. Uh, just highlighting Garrison Matthews again, very, very quickly. He finished with 16 points on six of 13 shooting. He's shown an ability to not just be a sharpshooter, but to also be a quality cutter. 
Um, he understands when defenses are overplaying him how to, you know, cut back door and get easy looks right at the rim, especially when he's cutting when guys like Jay Sean or Alper and Shingun have the ball and they're able to hit him. Or conversely, um, he had a cut where KPJ fed him beautifully off of an inbounds play. Uh, it was the baseline and KPJ was, you know, throwing the ball in. Garrison just cut towards the rim and KPJ hit him beautifully. And then a few possessions later, the Rockets were doing another inbounds play, but this one was on the sideline and Eric Gordon had a cut or a little curl towards the rim and KPJ hit him beautifully again. So those were the two assists that I wanted to highlight that I mentioned earlier from KPJ out of his six assists in this game before he was sidelined for the rest of it. And, you know, the fact that those plays are kind of there now and, and, coalescing it just shows that the Rockets are playing with a, a bit more chemistry that they're seeing things and being able to generate some easy buckets that weren't there for them earlier in this season right they they weren't creating those opportunities earlier in the season they weren't on the same page with their cutting with you know connecting with each other that kind of thing so this team is finally you know creating some of that chemistry and is is learning you know where each other where they like their spots how to get the ball in in easy places to score all that stuff so I just wanted to point those two things out. Um, but back to the, the big thing, which is we saw Alper and Shingun and Christian would share the floor. And here's the problem. And I've had plenty of people in the YouTube comments, in my mentions on Twitter, you know, begging, wondering, why is Alper and Shingun not getting more minutes? It's a tough question to solve, right? And it's it, it could just be relatively easy. You should be like, oh, well, just, you know, do whatever you need to do to get Shingun 20 to 25 minutes a night. That's a bit of an issue when you've got a you know all-star caliber center in Christian Wood who can you know who should reasonably reasonably <laughs> be playing 32 to 36 minutes a night, right? And who's been on an absolute monster tear since being moved to the five spot. So far, Steven Silas has done a wonderful job in prioritizing Alper and Shingun over Daniel Tice as the backup big. Um and it's just tough because when C. Wood needs 30 to 36 minutes at the five spot, Alper and Shingun's only going to get, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, if that, a night. So this was the, our first glimpse of Steven Silas being willing to play those two guys at the same time, kind of to counteract some of the size from the Orlando Magic, um, which was a smart play by Steven Silas. I, I love that to get, keep a little bit more size in there because the Rockets were having some, you know, struggling with a bit of the size of the Orlando Magic. But not only that, these two guys can play off of each other. And Christian said just as much post game when I asked him, I said, you know, you haven't played with the double big lineup throughout, you know, this, this win streak, hardly at all, you know, and, you know, how did it feel playing with Al P and what is it like being out there with him? Um, and Christian basically said, you know, being out there with Al P, you know, and, and me being able to play off of him and the guys being able to play off of him with his passing and his vision is magnificent. Those were Christian, were, uh, Christian Wood's words about Alper and Shingun. And it's true. The difference between Al P and, and Daniel Tice and the reason that Al P can work on the floor at the same time as Christian Wood, even though he is, you know, for all intents and purposes, considered a non-shooter, similarly to the way that Daniel Tice was, is that he is able to create things with his playmaking, with his vision, going off the dribble, all these different things that Daniel Tice can't consistently do, right? So I followed up with Christian by asking, when you're out there with Al P, are you more of the screener? Is he more of the screener? Do you kind of share those duties? Is it dependent on matchups, right? I wanted to know in his mind, how do you operate when you have Shingun on the floor next to you. And Christian said, I think when, you know, when I, when I'm out there with Al P it's best for, you know, him to have the ball in his hands, right. Because of his passing. And so Christian said that, you know, he, he believes that that's the better way to kind of run things is to let Al P have the ball, you know, be it in, be it in the high post, be it on the low post, whatever, and have Christian be the guy spacing the floor or have him set up, um, you know, off on the side or in, and having Al P he, he said that, you know, in this game specifically against the Magic, Christian felt that he was more of the screener while the, while those two were on the floor together. But just kind of knowing that Christian understands how he can play off of Alpi's passing uh, leads me to believe that that duo can still find a lot of success, right? And this was our first step in the right direction of Steven Silas maybe toying with the idea of, okay, he's going to maybe slowly, gradually increase Alper and Shingun's minutes, maybe have a little bit of time each half instead of waiting till the end of a game where those two are going to overlap with each other. And there was, you know, a distinct possibility that Alpi may have played even longer than he had into the fourth quarter had he not, you know, 
been, been already playing for a significant stretch of time at that point. So that duo can find a lot of success. Uh, and I'm really interested to see how Steven Silas balances that moving forward, especially if Kevin Porter Jr. is going to be out for any extended period of time. We still don't know about Jalen Green. We got our first <clears throat> update from Steven Silas this past Friday, and the update was there's no update. The update was we're going to take it week by week with Jalen, um, which is, you know, it's not much, but it's something. And then with Kevin Porter Jr., the Rockets just need to keep him out until he's healthy. And that's got to be the case with this team. They can't keep bringing him back where he keeps re-aggravating the same, you know, thigh injury that's already sidelined him, you know, at points this season, causing him to leave games early. He just needs to be held out until he is 100% healthy. It sucks, especially because this team has been playing some, you know, it's best basketball of the season, clearly uh, during this five game win streak. But this team will survive without KPJ. They need him to get right. They need Jalen to get right. And there are plenty of guys who can hold down the fort in their absence. Now, does that mean that maybe the team entertains the idea of bringing John Wall back in the interim? Uh, I still don't think it's the right move because if you bring John Wall back, you know, to be, you know, the starting point guard for a hand, you know, five, 10 games, maybe if KPJ's out, you know, if that long, right, you know, we could be talking two or three games that KPJ's out for. And then you have to have that hard conversation with Wall about moving him to the bench. So I still don't think that's the right move. Um, I think that, you know, both sides need to come to an agreement that works for, for all parties involved. And unfortunately, Wall starting is not the agreement, you know, is not the move that works for this Rockets team at this current point in time. So with that, um, I think that's got, you know, I'm covering all the bases that I wanted to hit on from this game. Uh yeah, covered cover all my bases. I just didn't want to have to share this this win in a pod talking about what will hopefully we're manifesting here a win against the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, also, just on my way out of here because I haven't had a platform to talk about this on yet. <laughs> just, we need to relegate the OKC Thunder franchise. Like, come on, man, losing by seventy three points to the Memphis Grizzlies with no John Morant playing? Like, what is going on in Oklahoma City, man? You know, the Rockets were rolling out lineups without, you know, pictures of all five starters. They had Jeremy Lamb with a Rockets logo on his face last season, and they never lost by 73 points, you know, rolling out the most different starting lineups in NBA history last season, and they never lost by 73 points. I am just appalled by what's going on with the state of the OKC, OKC franchise. The Rockets beat them back to back and then they just collapsed. They, they just, they completely crumbled. Apparently, uh, you know, the, the two losses by the, against the Houston Rockets were too much to bear, but yeah, with that, that's going to wrap up today's episode. Uh, as always appreciate, appreciate you checking out the show. Thank you for bearing with me as I'm getting through whatever this, uh, this cough, this illness is. I'm sorry about the intermittent coughing throughout the show. I hope it's not, uh, excruciating to listen to. But with that, if you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing to the show, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to your podcasts, the brand new Odyssey app, please consider subscribing, share it with your friends and family. If you like this show, if you like the Rockets, tell everybody about the show. Um, that's how we keep this thing going strong uh, so that we can keep you covered for all things Houston Rockets. Also check out the YouTube channel, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff. But for today's episode, that's going to do it. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.